Now joining us in studio to discuss this further this evening is ANN7 business editor, Mr. Clive Ramatabela-Smith, as well as ANN7's uh, resident uh, political analyst, Mr. Safiso Matlangu. Good afternoon or good evening rather to both of you gentlemen. Uh, Clive, let me start with you. I just want you to once again unpack the details for us. Uh, besides your initial reactions, how would the banks collude in this nature? What steps did, did they take to, 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 uh, to do this? Thank you very much, Abigail. I mean, it's a very simple concept here that we want to apply so that everybody can understand Please. what the banks actually did. So for every bank, they have what we call uh, a capital adequacy ratio in which they spread their risk and according to bonds, equity, whatever it is that they want to buy. And also they can sell and resell their own debt. So they can sell, if you've got a bond, they can s sell that bond to somebody else on a cash basis or on a return basis based on the interest that that person will be, get will be getting. So what we have here is a number of banks who understand in terms of um, how currency ships affect the, both the value of our, 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 our own domestic currency and those that are going globally. So what these guys have done is they've had a group chat. In this group chat, they're able to talk to one another to tell the other guys from other central uh, banking institutions from outside South Africa, the rest of the world. I mean, you saw the list of the banks that are involved there. And some of them, uh, it's not the first time they're involved in controversy. But what they then do is they, they read and send each other reports and advice, just like you do on a trading platform. They tell the other guys, listen, this is what's going to be happening. So you must start selling this particular currency because we feel that because of this, that and the other, normally that would be uh, validated reasons why they feel that that should happen. So, for example, if you're a South African representative of a trader, you would tell the rest of your, your mates that, listen, it seems like if, uh, the interest rates are going to go up in South Africa. That's the sentiment. I think this is what you must do. You must short the rand or other long the rand. And what they do is they communicate in that particular portal of information, call it a chat group, as, as it were. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is, if you start sending wrong messages that have negative effect on what happens in the domestic currency, that's what the rest of the guys globally would think about that domestic currency, and they'll, set, they'll start dumping it. I'll give you an example, and no uh, 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 conspiracy uh, alluded to here, but what they did was, if you remember, Come 912, or what's been called, they uh, tagged the Nanagate, they would have been told that the Minister of, um, of, of Finance has been uh, fired in South Africa. So what you would then do is, depending on whether you believe that this will be sustainable or this will have long-term uh, repercussions, you can then start to influence, and I'm using influence in a very politically correct way, mm -hmm. influence where the currency ships should be and what those people's positions should be in terms of the sovereign bonds that they sell, the cash, the, the, the equities that they have, or even including the forex currencies that they own. So they can then start dumping it. And so the control of whether the RAN is weak or strengthened then depends on what these few group of people believe uh, in, in a global context. And that's how then it is uh, the competition commission's finding that these people actually could have influenced things from 2007 hmm. with regards to where the RAND stands or any other currency for that matter anywhere mm -hmm. in the world. Well, I want to continue this conversation and really uh, touch on repercussions as well, but we are joined uh, uh, on the phone line by uh, Petri Redling Hayes, uh, her in your capital advisor, uh, joins us, uh, like I said, over the phone line. Good evening to you and thank you for joining us here on ANN7. Uh, besides your initial reaction uh, and observations with regards to this uh, collusion, I also just wanted to touch on whether this uh, uh, came to light and now we can, whether we can question you know, the losses that we experienced uh, uh, during 2015 and also the jitters we saw uh, in 2016. What sort of role do you think this entire debacle played during that time? Well, uh, good evening and, and thank you very much for having me. Um, before I address, uh, address your question, I just want to, to uh, make a comment on some of the commentary that uh, uh, came out of the EFF saying, you know, that this is white minority capital uh, manipulating the markets for their own benefit. Mm -hmm. um, I absolutely and categorically disagree with that. I think that taking it to an entire racial plane that it need not be. Um, these are 17 international banks working together to make profit. Uh, yes, that is questionable behavior, but it has got absolutely nothing to do with the race. Um, you know, when banks work together like this or traders work together like this, you, you know, back in the day, 
uh, there were there were trading rooms where people interacted with each other hundreds at a time, buying and selling stock. And sure, the people were having discussions with each other and working together. Uh, today, we all sit at uh, you know behind our computer desks, um, trading you know digitally through through the internet essentially, uh, and people still to this day chat and interact with one another. And uh, sometimes. People have nefarious, uh, uh, you know, they have a lot of ammunition in the sense that they have massive amounts of capital behind them, a.k.a. the banks. Um, and you know what? There's a bunch of traders who are doing it not for any other political, or for any political motivation, other than, you know, they want to make profit. Because if they make profit, they get paid bonuses. So the problem is not white minority capital, but rather just general human greed uh, on a global scale. You know, you've got 17 banks from countries all over the world uh, that we're doing this. It's not uh, a plot against uh, the South African citizens in any way. Hmm. Petri, if you could maybe just uh, elaborate uh, your thoughts on, on the entire 2015-2016 uh, debacle and how much uh, of an impact uh, uh, the collusion had on that time. Right. So I do think that, uh, you know, I mean, the details are a bit scant at this point. So we're all really kind of just speculating to see whether or not... Um, you know, with regard to what happened, I think we must take some time and read through the report and see exactly what the allegations are. Mm -hmm. uh, I do know that this is an investigation that has been going for, for two or three years. So by the time that they come out and say, listen, you know, we have a case, we are charging with collusion, uh, they, they have more than likely got a really solid case and, and some, some good evidence. Um, you know, I just think that w what happens is sometimes, uh, you know, it could have probably benefited to a lot of the weakness that we've seen in the rand. There's been a a lot of negative sentiment around the, the, the ruling party in South Africa, uh, and people could trump that up and make things sound a lot worse in the in the in the outside world or in the in the more developed market. Um, you know, make it sound a lot worse than what it really is on the ground in South Africa, uh, and really try to influence the sentiment that other traders and other international institutions have mm -hmm. um, in trying to, to to benefit from that because they might be positioned uh, in a position short rand or. or you know, we're in a, in a situation where if the currency weakened, uh, they could benefit. Um, so I do think that, you know, when we see things like Nenegate, um, that that is almost a catalyst. So perhaps the reaction that we saw to Nenegate was not actually, uh, you know, that reaction that the market gave where the currency slid incredibly far uh, in a very short period of time. In a situation like that, I think that perhaps with people working together, they could push the currency further than what it rightfully should be. Um, but I, I'm not sure that they can have long-term effects uh, on, on what the fair value of the currency is. I mean, if you look at the way the currency is trading at the moment, we, we're coming down, uh, we've dipped down below 13 Rand again today. And I think that is, um, you know, that, that was a, quite a very sharp move. Uh, that we saw over the last two days in the rand, and I think that is more the currency reacting to some of the fundamental, uh, you know, aspects of our economy as well as what's happening in the outside world, uh, and it's trying to find its fair value. Uh, I think that you know, when there's collusion and things like this. Uh, it's basically a bunch of guys with, with big checkbooks bullying the currency into a direction that they want it to go, so that they can make more more money. I don't think that um, that they would have had any sort of really long-term impact on what the fair value of the rand was. I think the market is simply too big for that. But I do think uh, that in the shorter term, they could push the currency into situations where it overreacts and it extends 10% uh, in a couple of days rather than the 3 or 4% that it should have um, under normal circumstances if they weren't colluding. Mm. Petri, just lastly, with regards to there being any signs that this sort of colluding uh, continued into 2016 and even 2017, uh, are there signs of that? Um, well, I don't really know. I mean, to be to be very truthful with you, I'm not a uh, not a currency trader. I'm more of an equity trader, and I, I watch more equity markets and shares mm. and so on. Um, but I do think that, uh, you know, that it was an ongoing investigation uh, over the last couple of years. So uh, as far as I understand the story, the Competition Commission were aware uh, of this chat group and uh, the types of activities that was going on in there. Uh, and they spent some time educating themselves on, uh, you know, exactly how the forex market works and how traders interact with each other, as well as how the whole bid offer process works and the, and the order books where these currency trading takes place in. Um, 
so they, I, you know, I believe that they they spent a lot of time watching uh, and gathering evidence and educating themselves to truly understand what it is that that's going on. Uh, so, uh, you know, just because I don't see the evidence doesn't mean that it's not there. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, uh, Petri, for your time. We appreciate you talking to us and unpacking those details for us. We're also joined on the phone line now by Mr. Mzwanile Manyi. Uh, good evening to you, Mr. Manyi. Thank you for joining us here on ANN7. Just uh, your initial reactions uh, to the collusion uh, by uh, 17 banks, that is including APSA as well as Standard Bank. Uh, what are your views and comments? Yeah, look, uh, in our submission, uh, uh, as a progressive professional forum, uh, to the president when we were saying the fake bill should not be signed. One of the statements we made is that banks do not have the moral authority to be given this major responsibility of having basically law outsourced to them. This now, what has happened, this rogue activity by these banks is the clearest sign that banks cannot be trusted uh, with the lives of the people. And uh, for us as Progressive Professional Forum, we are calling on the full might of the law uh, to be uh, exercised on these banks uh, so that indeed uh, this criminality must be rooted out. This actually brings the whole credibility of the fake bill into question. That if we are saying we are trying to combat corruption and we outsource the power to manage corruption to corrupt people, I mean, really, what is this? This on its own should be a reason why the thick bill should be reconsidered. Banks cannot have the powers of the thick bill when they are this corrupt. And we've got clear evidence now, and I hope they get fined huge amounts of money. And for, as, as Progressive Professionals Forum, we're going to write to the president once again to say we, we need to reconsider the various executive authorities that are in this bill. The current powers that are given to the banks with this, with this rogue uh, exposure that we've just seen now, it means that uh, we'll be sending our lives away. South Africa, the world, cannot uh, afford this. So we will be calling upon all parties concerned to say this is how they should see the fake bill. This is what we've been afraid of as Progressive Professionals Forum to say these people who want this much power they are not clean. They are not vetted. This is what we've been saying. Uh, now we are very, we actually vindicated uh, in, in our posture to say we can't have our lives at the hands of such rogue elements. Mm -hmm. Mr. Manier, we hear your comments. Uh, we'd like you to stay on the line with us. We want to continue this conversation with you. But uh, news just coming in this evening. The South African Reserve Bank has reacted to the announcement by the Competition Commission. The Reserve Bank says it sees the allegations in a serious light. The South African Reserve Bank will allow the legal process now initiated to run its course and will continue to monitor developments closely to inform any action that we may need to embark on in accordance with our mandate and jurisdiction. This is with regards uh, to the news that came in uh, with uh, regards to the collusion of 17 banks, uh, both internationally, local as well, uh, APSA and uh, Standard Bank included uh, in that collusion. Uh, I'm still joined in studio by uh, political analyst uh, Safisa Matlango as well as Clive Ramachabela smith Safisa, let me come to you. Let's talk repercussions and also what this means with regards to the credibility of our, of our financial institutions. We were talking earlier and we were asking the question whether or not it's time for a state-owned bank or not. Well, it's definitely time for a state-owned bank. Uh, it's been time for a state-owned bank for about 25 years now. But because of the likes of APSA and Standard Bank, they've uh, barricaded the process, they've uh, vanguarded the access of foreign banking institutions, they've monopolized the RAND, and so it was almost impossible for um, the government to set up uh, a state bank. Mm. The post office doesn't have the infrastructure, to, to be a state bank, it would be very expensive to, to have a state bank, but it has become the consideration of cabinet, particularly because this is the year of uh, radical economic transformation. But I just want to give you an example, Abigail, and say, uh, if you know that you have no money and you walk into an elevator and you hear some coins trinkling on the floor, uh, you don't go down and look for them unless you're a thief. 
but you don't go down and look for them because you know you have no money. So if the rent drops in this country, it just drops for those who have money. Mm -hmm. And so it's monopolized, it's fractured, um, it's played upon. Uh, the rand uh, doesn't belong to South Africans. And so I'm glad by the South African Reserve Bank statement, but I do also hope that this is not just lip service because there are those who carry the rand, uh, that being APSA and Standard Bank and many others. And uh, this collusion is not just because they colluded um, and fixed prices. They set up competitions for cars and nobody won that car. This 10% that they're going to, to find, They'll only get it later. They'll only repatriate it. They'll only escalate prices and uh, recover their money. And it's not a new thing. It's not a nuance. It's something that has been happening all along. If they allowed for a new kid on the block, uh, all this uh, Saudi air business would, uh, would be exposed. And obviously, they don't want that. They want to monopolize the economy. They want to play on the the un the unknowledge or the ignorance of south africans and really gather as much as they can uh, this is the hand of white monopoly capital mm -hmm. and i'm glad that it has come to light it's been something we have been uh, preaching about all along it's not just this money that i believe apsa must pay they must really also pay for the billions they took uh, from the transition government from the government of national unity to the uh, the democratic government that came uh, after the 27th of April in 1994. Mm. But I do commend uh, wh whoever came up with this information, the, the repatriate unit of uh, uh, World Bank, uh, for coming out and saying that uh, even in South Africa, banks have acted illegally. I don't know uh, of cabinets or SAPS's power to, to charge anyone because this is an act of fraud. When you tell people to invest some money because they'll win cars and you collude their, their hard, hard end funds, that's essentially fraud and corruption. So we don't know at this point who will be charged. Usually in a situation like this, the, the first person in, in, in the bank, in APSA, which is Maria Ramos, would have to be charged. We don't, we don't know whether it will get there or not, but there certainly needs to be repercussions. Mm -hmm. They will not just say, well, we've paid back the money and so, um, you know, let's just, let's just forget it and let's just move on. Mm. There must be an accountability report. Mm. And I hope that this is not the end um, of the statement, that as the South African Reserve Bank has stated, they continue to dig. And so we call for anyone with other information, other organizations that are aware of uh, APSA's corruption and the corruption of other banks. We also expect the FIC to make a stand comment. I really am interested to know uh, what the Financial Intelligence Center will say. I'm particularly also interested to hear how Treasury will respond. Mm. I'm also interested to hear how uh, our finance minister, Mr. Praveen Gordon, has to, to say about this. Mm -hmm. And so this matter shall not end today. Even as APSA is going to pay back the money, uh, because they've been charged 10% of profits after they've paid back. I know that people will continue to dig. And I tell you this, many skeletons are about to come out of this closet. Mm. Clive, let me come to you. And, and some people are saying that this is once again uh, politics at play. What is uh, the Minister of Finance, Brevin Gordon, going to say? Your view with regards to all of this? Unfortunately, <laughs> politically, um, I'm really an illiterate. I, I have no voice whatsoever. But do you think what that I the do Minister know, of Finance should be coming forward yeah, in, in, yeah, in this yeah, regard? Yeah, and my two cents worth of, because I'm not as astute as my colleague here. So what I do know for a fact is that uh, this is not, uh, from, uh, from a political uh, point of view, this is serious because it means that information has been fed into um, investors' minds that a currency's value is uh, at X, it well, in reality, is that why? Mm -hmm. That in itself is an act that is unlawful because obviously it will control the trends of which people invest, uh, the confidence with it. You can imagine, I mean, can you think about it? Uh, it's, it's just as much the same as when rating agencies got the 2008 uh, uh, recession wrong. Um, it, might have, it, it, it might be easier for them to get out of it, but a lot of people invest in believing that the rating agencies know what they're doing and they invest based on their advice. So now all of a sudden if things go wrong, you can't then turn back and say, well, no, we didn't know anything about it because you, know, you, you benefit from that because that's why you get paid. In the same sense, um, in this regard, 
whether or not, because I know this is what happens at JP Morgan, at, uh, uh, at Morgan Stanley, if you go there, if you go to your Citibank, what they normally would say is that there will be somebody who will be, uh, uh, who'll take the hit for it. So there'll be somebody who will get fired because they've been caught and, and then they will pay a fine. And then after that, everything is honky dory again. Mm -hmm. But we have to remember, a country suffered its reputation, it suffered its currency, it suffered its economy, based mm -hmm. on information that is false. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know what's worse than that other than treason because, <laughs> you, you know, you have falsified information in order for a few to actually gain. Mm -hmm. So that is, that is how serious I take it on the side of political uh, interference. But in terms of financial law as well, you'd have to be taken. If, if action can be taken against clients that participate with the banks because they feel that there's political influence, what more the bank that actually itself positions a currency, positions the country's economy and puts it at risk simply because they want to gain profit. Mm. What worse? That, there's not a worse crime than that. So then the question is, can we close down the accounts of the banks? And the answer, only you can tell us, Abigail. <laughs> I think I'll step away from that one. But gentl uh, gentlemen, unfortunately, we have run out of time. Always appreciate talking to you. Uh, Clive Ramatabela-Smith, as well as uh, Safisa Matlango on the phone line. Joining us there was uh, Mr. Mzwanele Mani from the Progressive Professionals uh, Forum. Thank you to all of our guests uh, this evening. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. But do remember, we want our viewers to get involved in this discussion. You can tweet us at ANN7 TV uh, is our Twitter handle. ANN7 Prime with uh, Cindy Mabi is up next. Uh, good night and enjoy.